afternoon, everyone. I want to go ahead and get started. So first of all, uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Melody Jackson. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Degree Programs and Student Affairs here at Harvard Kennedy School. I'm also a 2001 graduate of the school's mid-career program, and it is an honor to be with you all, uh, and certainly an honor to be here with our speakers. Um, our namesake, President John F. Kennedy, once said, nations may rise and fall, but an idea lives on. Ideas here is a celebration of ideas that make the world a better place. And I don't think we have to look much further than the wonderful speakers you're going to hear from today um, to see what can happen when intelligent, uh, in innovative ideas are set in motion. So with that, I want to just briefly introduce um, very quickly, I'm going to give a quick introduction of our speakers and then come back and give you a little bit more detail about each one before they come up and speak. But briefly, so you know who's with us today, we have Moise Cherum, who's founding partner and CEO of Enova. Thank you for being here. We have Aleem Ahmed and Caroline Malden, co-founders of Love Brain. Uh, Debian Bin and Jim Taylor, co-founders and CEOs of Proximity Designs. And Livio Valenti, co-founder of Vaxis Technologies. So I, I want to say thank you to our speakers for being here. Uh, some of you have traveled quite far um, from Myanmar and Mexico to be here with us, uh, so thank you for making that effort. Uh, so the, a quick explanation on the format today. So I've asked each, all, our, our, all of our panelists uh, are, have some very exciting initiatives to share today. I've asked each of them, um, one by one I'm going to have them come up and give brief presentations on those ventures. Uh, and then we're going to shift uh, to a broader panel discussion with uh, everyone and then begin to open it up for Q&A. So let me start first uh, with Moise Cherum. Moise is CEO of one, and one of three founding uh, partners of Enova, a social enterprise that brings technology-based learning to low-income communities in Mexico. Uh, and he is helping narrow the digital divide. About two-thirds of Mexico's citizens do not have internet access, and only 25 out of every 100 students graduate from high school. Enova designs, builds, and runs the learning and innovation network called RIA, which is a series of 70 educational centers and 25 digital libraries that are equipped with computers, ta tablets, and audiobooks. And more than 100,000 people have graduated from Enova's learning centers so far, and 350,000 people of all ages have used its services. Moise was awarded the Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award by the Schwab Foundation at the World Economic Forum on Latin America. He was also named among the top 10 entrepreneurs in Mexico by Expansion Magazine, the country's leading business publication. And we're proud to say um, that he is a 2009 graduate of uh, Harvard Kennedy School's Master's in Public Policy program. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Moise Chairman. So I would like to begin this session by uh, telling you about some of my academic failures. And it's very refreshing to do this in Harvard because now I don't have to impress the admissions committee. Um, so I'm going to be frank about it. So that's me when I was uh, 15. Um, and at the time, I enjoyed uh, classes such as existential literature or history, but I had a lot of trouble with math. Um, my fellow classmates would move on, and I graduated at the level that is expected of sophomores. So this was the textbook I had. And at the time, I had basically three sources for learning math. One was the professor, who I would argue was somewhat unclear and not very engaging. Uh, the second one, this textbook, which was relatively obscure. And the third was a very compassionate classmate who would study with me uh, right before the test. And I would argue that with the disruptions in education technology, uh, today I would have a much better shot at passing that final exam. Uh, through content that is a lot friendlier than that textbook, uh, I could now go online and engage with uh, many different ways of uh, understanding the concept that I wasn't uh, understanding back in, in high school. Um, so eventually I became a good student. I went to law school where math is not really required. And this great school even managed to teach me econometrics. Uh, but in other circumstances, the story would have been very different. Uh, for example, in Korea, uh, based on the college entrance exam, I would have probably been assigned to gutting fish uh, for a living. 
uh, or in Mexico, 60% um, of students drop out of high school. So without a supportive environment, I would have been one of those dropouts. Um, so is technology going to fix education? Um, yes and no. Uh, technology will help kids uh, who have at least a mediocre educational system and who have a support network. Uh, if you think about Khan Academy, Khan Academy was designed for Khan's cousins. And they all live in American suburbs and they could watch the uh, lessons on YouTube. But what if you live in a country where two thirds of the population does not have access to the internet, uh, where you have a very significant uh, skills gap? And what if you go to a school that is part of the worst educational system in all of the OECD countries? Then you need a solution that is more complex, more difficult to implement, that can't just rely on a great website. And you need to set up an entirely new ecosystem. You need a new eco ecosystem with adequate infrastructure, with good teachers, with good content, and with robust mechanisms to evaluate impact. That is why I got together with two friends from high school and founded the Learning and Innovation Network. We wanted to take the advantages that technology brought for us and take them to everyone in Mexico. What we did was create a network of blended learning schools located in low-income areas that are open to everyone. So there are no requirements. The only thing you need to enroll is the will to learn. Uh, through a process that we call urban acupuncture, what we do is we analyze uh, urban neighborhoods to understand where a school will attract the most students. Uh, then we find teachers who are recent college graduates and who are very motivated to facilitate the e-learning process. 68% of the people who come to our schools have never touched a computer. So what we did was to create a very uh, concise course. It is only 72 hours of class time. Uh, and uh, during that time, we get people to learn how to use a computer, to learn how to use the internet, and to become proficient in using office software. And then what we do is we send them on paths according to their profiles. So if you're a kid, you will come to an after school program where you will reinforce your math and Spanish skills. We also have a module on value so that uh, people can reflect on the ethical challenges that they deal with every day. Uh, for adults, we have courses on micro entrepreneurship, uh, financial literacy, and we teach English to everyone so that they can properly interact with the internet. Um, so far, we've built 95 uh, centers that have attracted almost uh, half a million users. Uh, we've graduated almost uh, over 150,000 uh, graduates from our programs. And this is the type of impact that we're looking for. We want to scale. Uh, everyone says that education is the key, but the question is, how do you create initiatives that can scale and that can truly prove impact? So following the HKS dogma for impact evaluation, what we did was um, we created a, an internal lab uh, to evaluate the performance of our programs uh, through experimental methods. And what we were able to, to, to understand was that in a course that only lasts 30 hours, uh, we could improve the skills of kids uh, by the same amount that a good teacher uh, would improve over the course of a year and a half in school. So we believe that uh, well-executed um, programs can really uh, change lives. And, um, well, this is part, part of what uh, HKS teaches you, which is to be very um, strict about the data collection and the, and the data analysis. Um, this works as a tri-sector partnership, so we have the public, social, and private sectors each doing uh, what it does best. And what we were able to, to find was a, a right balance so that kids in the Mexican slums would have access to better e-learning technologies than kids in elite Mexican schools. Um, we like sharing an OVA story because we believe that social enterprises are the way of the future and we would like to see more governments partnering with social enterprises to solve public problems in innovative ways. We have the vision of making sure that every kid in Mexico is able to become the best possible version of himself and that they do not get sidetracked of in life if, like me, they failed math in high school. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Moise. Um, I'd now like to tell you a little bit about uh, Alim Ahmed and Caroline Malden, uh, the co-founders of Love Brain. 
Alima Carolyn launched Love Grain last year while students at the Kennedy School to produce gluten-free cereals, pastas, pancakes, and waffle mix that are all made of teff, a high-protein, high-fiber grain that's a staple in the Ethiopian diet. The Love Grain idea was inspired by Alim's experience working for the TEP value chain program at the Ethiopian Agricultural Transformation Agency. He worked to help three million farmers increase their yields and in the process learned that some seven million TEP farmers lack a market for their grain. But it wasn't until he and Caroline met uh, as dual degree MPA, MBA students at HKS and uh, MIT Sloan that they saw the opportunity to bring healthy gluten-free products to the US market while at the same time helping to improve the lives of Ethiopian families, uh, farmers and their families in a sustainable way. The idea evolved into a business plan and with input from fellow classmates and professors, uh, it took off from there. And Love Grain has gone on to win the top $10,000 prize at the 2013 MIT Ideas Global Challenge, as well as the MIT Africa Innovative Business Plan Competition. Earlier this year, Caroline was the co-winner of the first startup pitch competition held by MIT Sloan Man Women in Management. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Owen Murphy. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aleem. And I'm Caroline, and we are really excited to be here with you to share um, about Love Grain. Love Grain is a new kind of food company that's connecting farmers to families through a line of nutritious and delicious gluten-free products based on teff. As Melody said, teff comes from Ethiopia. And this is our business model in one slide. We believe that we can build a different kind of value chain for agriculture. It's not just a value chain, it's a value cycle. So instead of extracting value from one part of the world and sending it to another, we're actually sending it back to Ethiopian farmers through microfinance and then packaging their grain into a line of delicious and nutritious products. So teff is an ancient Ethiopian grain that's been grown for over 5,000 years in Ethiopia. It's the tiniest grain in the world. It gives it wonderful nutritional properties. So because it's the smallest grain, that means the ratio of its outside to inside is the highest, giving it the most fiber of, of any cereal crop. It's also got a subtle nutty flavor. And you may know it um, as the, the base that goes into injera, the spongy bread um, in Ethiopian food. And when it's not fermented, it has a nice, subtle, nutty flavor. So when I worked for the Ethiopian government on agriculture projects, I got to know some of the country's six million teff farmers. And one of them is named, a woman named Tigist. And Tigist means patience in Amharic. But she's really been waiting too long for change. As we walked through her field, she explained to me that her soils are exhausted from over-tilling and from under-fertilization. The seeds she uses are older and less productive. At harvest, she needs cash so badly that she chooses to sell to middlemen. And then, at the end of the day, she doesn't have enough money to pay for medicine or her kids' school fees. So Love Green's going to try to change all of this by financing seed and fertilizer for her at, at, um, at planting. She'll be able to double the amount of yield she gets from the same amount from her from her same plot. By purchasing direct from her, we'll be able to give her a price that's 25% higher what she normally gets. That means at the end of the day, Tigus will have three times the profits in her pocket than she would have otherwise, allowing her to diversify her diet, pay for her kids' school fees, and even buy medicine when she needs to. And that's what's beautiful about the, the Love Green business model, is that it's designed for scale. So within a few years, we expect to be working with over 4,000 Ethiopian farmers and have generated over $300,000 in profits for those farmers. And Love Green isn't just um, a fair trade company. We really see our growth in three phases. One is quite literally seeding the market for TEF in the US. Uh, the second is then purchasing directly from Ethiopian cooperatives. And the third is to contribute to East Africa's economic development by building a facility in Ethiopia to export value-added products across the world. So let's take a step back and talk about um, this market that Ali mentioned that we're trying to seed here in the United States. So market experts say that TEF is actually going to follow quinoa's trajectory in terms of um, popularity in the United States. So what you see here is actually the growth of quinoa imports into the U.S. since 2004. Now imagine that TEF is um, now where quinoa was 10 years ago. That's what we're projecting. 
And we know that um, if TEF, if it reaches the number of people that quinoa has, it is a $200 million opportunity. So how does Love Grain differentiate itself? Well, I'm gluten-free. I've been gluten-free for about four years, which means that I am intimately aware of the lack of offerings in the gluten-free market. <laughs> they don't taste good, they don't look good, and they are not good for you. So Love Grain is trying to set ourselves apart on all three of those factors. You can see here how our nutrition compares actually to our uh, main competitors um, on pancake and waffle mixes. We are gaining market traction. We launched our first product, a pancake and waffle mix, based on TEF back in December. And since then, we've sold over 1,100 units. We've just reordered a second commercial run. Six, uh, we have a gross margin of 60% right now, and nine out of 10 of our customers have said they'd like to repurchase Love Grain. And we have an industry high standard of 75 for net, net promoter score. So the question is, We've now, we've now tested our first product. We know that people like our brand and, and, our, and the flavor of TEF, but we know there's a lot more to do. We have to get our product on the shelves and then off of shelves, and that takes a lot of work. So this, with our um, advisor group of, uh, who, of folks who have been working in fast-moving consumer goods, has helped us sort of map out Love Grain's growth in the United States over the next couple of years. Right now we're selling here in Cambridge at Violette Bakery as well as online through Abe's Market. And as we grow, we expect to be um, uh, selling through local shops here in Boston as well as Whole Foods, Kroger, and then larger stores around the United States. Now, getting off the shelves, big issue. So that's where you all come in. <laughs> you become our ambassadors for Love Green, telling everyone you know who's gluten-free about the wonders of TEF. We are already doing pancake parties at friends' houses where they invite their friends, much like Tupperware parties. And we have famous gluten-free folks like Gwyneth Paltrow, anybody heard of her, who loves TAP. So we're envisioning reaching out to folks like that who can really embrace Love Grain's delicious product and our awesome mission. So with that, thank you for helping us make it grain. <laughs> Caroline for, I can't help myself, but giving us amazing food for thought. <laughs> I'm sure you've never heard that before. Uh, so next, I want to turn to um, Debbie Anton and Jim Taylor, co-founders and CEOs of Proximity Designs. Uh, Proximity is a social enterprise uh, that designs, makes, and markets very affordable products and services uh, to farmers and families in Myanmar. Uh, farmers use proximity products uh, and services to help them grow higher value crops and also uh, increase their annual income. And the numbers really speak for themselves. Since 2004, more than 2.5 million people have benefited from the company's products and services. Uh, Debbie and Jim met while develop doing development work in the Mississippi Delta in 1978 right out of college and have been together ever since. First working in Cambodia, rebuilding large-scale irrigation in, in, and in working in rural he health care, where they learned important lessons about really knowing the people they're work trying to help, uh, and also really understanding how to factor that into the work they do. Um, before Proximity, Debbie held various roles with USAID, the United Nations, the World Bank, uh, and other NGOs, uh, and Jim has worked in both the private sector and public sectors for more than 20 years. Uh, most recently, he received the 2012 Skoll Award for Social Entrepreneurship and was named the 2012 Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award by the Schwab Foundation. Uh, both Debbie and Jim are graduates of the Kennedy School's mid-career program. So let me turn it over to Jim. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jim Taylor. And I'm Debbie Hongbin. Um, so 10 years ago, we started out and, uh, to help Myanmar. I, I guess we're sort of drawn to difficult places um, where we think we can make a difference. And so Myanmar, is, I'm Burmese, and it's one of uh, the poorest and was one of the most isolated countries in the world um, after North Korea. So basically, after working in Cambodia uh, post-Khmer Rouge years in uh, reconstruction, we realized we really needed more skills in um, public policy analysis and economics. Um, and, and so we came to the Kennedy School, and um, it really helped lay, lay that groundwork for, for the kind of work we're doing in Myanmar. 
um, after the Kennedy School, we went to Indonesia for seven years, worked on on um, economic policy, and then after that, <coughs> the private sector uh, in California. So in 2004, we moved our two kids from California to Myanmar, and we've been there since then. Uh, when we started, Myanmar was very restrictive, and um, you couldn't do aid work. You, uh, there were very few donors there. Um, it was getting very little money. And uh, so, we, and we also knew that we didn't want to do traditional aid. Um, we wanted to have a really different relationship with people we were helping. Uh, and there was no policy audience, so you couldn't make an impact on policy. So basically, we decided to start a social enterprise and use a social enterprise approach. Um, and the core, of that, the core idea is to treat people as customers, not charity recipients or aid <coughs> beneficiaries. And that, that is what drives us and our whole organization, is um, a whole different relationship. It's one of um, respect and one of dignity and choice. And so we're held accountable by the customers we're trying to serve. Um, if, they don't, if we produce crap, they just don't buy it. And they tell, we get signals right away that what we are doing is, is not helpful. So I think that accountability is really important in, in uh, development work. Um, so what we do is we design and deliver products and services for rural families to living under $2 a day in Myanmar. There are about 40 million people. And uh, pr the products we design are basically what, what the private sector and public se sector ha are failing to provide. So that's our niche. And um, uh, they're in renewable energy products and uh, small scale irrigation and financial services. Um, and I'll let Jim continue. Yeah, besides treating people as customers, our second you know, big core idea for us is that it takes deep knowledge to solve the complex problems of poverty, and hence our name, Proximity. That we decided to locate to Myanmar and live there full time because we knew that that was the only way we were going to really understand what the needs were and really design solutions for it. So um, we began running this, operating this business. We started uh, importing some products, and we saw that they really weren't very well suited for Myanmar. They really weren't very suited, well suited for our customers. So we began to explore, besides the business and the economics training we had, we became exposed to the design world and how well-designed products and services, focusing on a customer, can really make the difference between a successful and a mediocre business. So we got connected um, with Stanford and their design and engineering program and set up a design lab in Myanmar, um, staffed with professional designers from both abroad and from Myanmar. And we began to design products and services. And this is, uh, we have a whole line of irrigation products. They're designed for extreme affordability and nice aesthetic design. <laughs> Low income customers like design just as much as we do. Uh, so we have a whole set of irrigation products. We also design services. We design, this is financial services. We've uh, taken traditional microfinance and flipped it around a little bit and designing financial services for rural farmers. Um, and I think the key thing for us is in designing innovations. Uh, we look for things that are high impact and high uh, scale. We're the largest irrigation provider in rural Myanmar now. We're the second largest uh, microfinance organization in the country. We're the largest farm finance organization. And we really think that it's important to take these innovations we're doing and, to, and make them a large scale. So what happened after um, several years and in 8,000 plus villages later uh, with customers is that uh, we saw that the macro policy environment uh, was really important because uh, our customers, if you have an overvalued exchange rate or um, you know there's, uh, there's a complete lack of credit, then um, all these things really were impacting how much incomes they could increase um, despite our products. And so we uh, because of our policy background, we said, yes, if we want to really um, have impact at scale, we need to get involved in the dysfunctional macro policy and uh, see the whole customer as part of that system. And so um, in 2009, we did finally start getting traction and getting um, an audience with the generals. 
and uh, largely because of our deep knowledge of the country. They knew that we knew more than they did <laughs> when it comes to rural conditions because they were getting you know, all good news going to the top for decades. And so they thought it was, everything was going well. But we were telling them, no, this is, you know, um, the farmers aren't doing well. So that's how we got started in our policy work. And we used our uh, rural networks and our um, knowledge of customers to really provide a research platform. Um, and we have a very close partnership with the Ash Center here, um, a dynamic, a great team here. Um, that's been an intellectual partnership. Basically, we've really basically done um, investigative economic research where no one was doing that for decades and no one had any idea. The data was all suspect. It's what we call muddy waters economics. <laughs> it's where the data is suspect and no one has a clue what's going on and no one's been researching it. And yet there's serious, serious poverty and um, big, big um, crises. Um, and so what we've done with the Ash Center group is basically converge the micro work with the macro to have a pretty powerful um, impact on, on um, policy. And so what we do is we engage with the leaders um, and just tell them sort of what we're like it is and telling the emperor he has no clothes and, uh, and just really, um, um, you know, making an influence on this. So I think that's in a way, we've used design for policy work as well in terms of uh, really road testing ideas and um, deep, with deep um, empathy and focus on the end, end, end user of that policy. So the design has also impacted our policy work. Um, and I think without the micro work that we do on the ground, really understand ground truthing macro um, analysis, um, we wouldn't be able to be that successful. And this is just a, one of our many customers. He's a landless um, laborer, casual laborer on a farm. And our products are always being demonstrated in villages and introduced. And basically, farmers take their turns um, um, test driving the products, getting up and testing the pump. and. Uh, so he was on there for a long time and wouldn't let anyone else on it. <laughs> so the farmer said, hey, it's our turn. Let him get off, get off. And he said, um, don't bother me. I'm dreaming. Aww. And he was a landless um, laborer his whole life. And for the first time, he found a product that he could afford, a pump. And this, would, this meant that he could finally farm his own plot of land um, that he would rent. And he was dreaming out the layout of this plot, where he would put the radishes, where he would put the corn, the eggplant. And, um, and so I think that's the kind of um, products we, we um, are striving to produce. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Debbie. And finally, uh, we have uh, Livio Valenti. Uh, Livio is the co-founder of Axis Technologies. Um, a life sciences company that has revolutionized uh, global health, is revolutionizing global health. Um, Vax has developed a patented technology that uses a protein in silk called fibroin to stabilize vaccines so that they can be shipped around the world uh, and stored without needing to be refrigerated. Vaccine preventable diseases like measles, mumps, and rubella play millions of lives every year. Many go without life-saving immunizations because the vaccines need to be kept cold uh, to be effective, and there simply hasn't been the infrastructure uh, in various parts of the world to overcome this obstacle to vaccine delivery. Uh, Vaxis began a startup as a startup here in the Harvard <coughs> Innovation Lab three years ago, while Livio was an MPP student here at the Harvard Kennedy School. The venture won first prize in the 2013 Harvard President's Challenge for Social Entrepreneurship, and also won the Harvard Business Plan Competition last year. Uh, before coming to HKS, Livio uh, worked for the United Nations in several developing countries. Uh, and he was featured recently in, in Forbes 30 Under 30 as a leader in the science and healthcare sector. Uh, please join me in welcoming Livio. Thank you so much. So I'm going to send around some of these first so people can see what silk is in this natural status, you can get one, that's it. 
because um, I've never seen one cocoon before, so I guess this is a good introduction. Um, but let me start from a little bit behind, um, from before coming to school. So what I was doing, I was helping farmers in uh, some of the developing countries trying to uh, grow silk. So we try to grow silk because it's a good way to diversify their economy. And this is some picture of the training that we do in, uh, in some of the farms in, in Cambodia. Um, and so I guess this is a picture that shows how low tech can be pretty effective sometimes, but sometimes not really too effective. So this is the way that you do silk. So you take these cocoons and you transform it and then you can make some fun, you know, fancy size like this. So this is not to show off, but it's Ferragamo. So. <laughs> I tried to contact them and say, do you want some of the silk that we grow in Cambodia from this UN project so you can do CSR? And they're like, show me the product. It's like, no way. It's such a bad quality because these guys are doing with the bicycle, um, you know, they're using very rudimentary ways. So they never make, like, Ferragamo would never use it. I'm sorry. Like, there's no CSR at all. So even all my Italian friends trying to help, they couldn't help. Um, so my question is like, you know, we spend what? $1 million in this UN project to grow silk? What can we do with this raw material that now you have in your hand? Um, and so I did some research, 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 and uh, I love TED. Uh, so I saw a TED talk. And there was a crazy professor, also from Italy, sorry for blowing the <laughs> horn, uh, that is here in Boston that invented all these technologies that use silk as a starting material for innovation. Um, so you can check the video. Uh, but he's basically using it for like all these different applications. So I just called him up, and then we became best friends, and we decided to start. <laughs> Still a short story. That's uh, um, when I brought into Cambodia. That was the the initial, um, let's say, falling in love for, for each other's stories. Um, and that's you know the first time that he went to developing countries, and so he could see what this technology can actually do on the field. Um, so what you can do with silk? He went a bit crazy, and he used this material for making bones making foldable electronics, vein replacement, knee ligaments, all sorts of things that you can think about. Um, but you know, I came to Harvard and my boss told me to stop working for the UN, go there you know, a couple of years and learn about everything that is not related to development. And so I <laughs> want to do something about technology, but this is what I know about technology. <laughs> <laughs> this is my, my last science class was in, in middle school. Um, but then I look back and I say, you know, what is the problem? How can I link these two different things that are so disconnected? And so I just ask myself this question. What is it to be seven in a low-performing country? And this is, you know, some of the images. And we, we talk always about rural, rural, rural. So what is rural? And this is rural. And, you know, there's my car and try to get there. And, you know, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, and then I try to, you know, when I came to school, I, I tried to frame this in a more conceptual level. And I look and it's like, it's not only the problem of that little girl is two from four million people die because they don't like they don't get access to vaccines. So for me that was you know that intellectual learning that was showing me that there was like a bigger problem. So we asked why. You know, what is the problem? And the cold chain is one of the problems. So vaccine needs to be between two and eight degrees C. Um, and if they're not, they just don't work. And a great innovation but they are limited somehow. Um, so you know People went a little bit crazy as well, and they tried to develop solution, this low-tech solution to the problem, and this is my friend from Stanford that developed the camera with a refrigerator on top, and sometimes they put beers inside. <laughs> but, you know, so we have one that is a deep story. But uh, what's our solution? So we take this uh, cocoon that you have in your hands, and we break down the fundamental proteins that are inside this cocoon. There are two proteins, fibrin and cytosine. And basically, we go through this process of creating a liquid silk um, that basically can be used as vaccine stabilizer. So we add this to the vaccine formulation, and basically we create vaccine that are need to be refrigerated. Um, seems too good to be true. There's some of the data that show that the meso vaccine has been stabilized for about six months at 45C. So if you look at the meso, this is the formulation without silk, and this is the formulation with silk, and it's 25 weeks. No loss of efficacy. You can administer to people. Um, so these data were pretty amazing for us. Um, the process of inspiration uh, was coming from all sources of the campus, I think. I bother pretty much every professor, every person that we come across, and Harvard president was kind enough to set up a meeting with, with my lifelong, lifelong idol and inspirational person, Professor Yunus. Um, and I guess this is some of the history about how we went about financing uh, our enterprise, and I just discovered that Harvard is our basically investor. <laughs> uh, they didn't ask much in return, so that was, that was nice. Uh, but we were lucky to win some of this competition, and um, I think we grew up and we went to the next level when we raised our serious 
funding from uh, the capital, so we went to get another mood of responsibility and it wasn't school project anymore. Um, and, um, and the Massachusetts government is also helping us in the picture. Um, so those are some of the, uh, we're very lucky to get a lot of you know, um, press and a lot of ideas came out of this technology that I, we believe it has an impact on, on, on global health from many standpoint. And I think it's uh, one of the solutions that can completely disrupt the administration of vaccine and the vaccine will be able to be distributed without refrigeration, which is uh, one of the main contributors to, uh, to global health. Um, so I just want to leave you with five takeaways. Uh, so think about if you could have a farmer in Cambodia, where I used to work before, that will grow some of these mulberry trees, which is the feed for the silkworm that basically are the raw material that we use. And then think about if you can train them, eco in some of the learning that you guys you know, just talked about and looking at those approaches. And then you can raise a lot of worms, which is very interesting. And then you can create some of these cocoons that you have in your hand. And then you use our crazy technology. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just can create vaccine that so this link between high tech and low tech, I think it's, it's very fascinating to me. And I think the impact is clear. And those are some of the pictures of mm -hmm. the people that I used to know. I want to give a special thank to uh, Kennedy School, in particular the SSP program that has been probably the most active venture capital of, that I ever met. So they invested in this idea from the day that I went there without having an idea. and just basically say that I want to use it to bring vaccines. And they look at me a bit strangely, but then they invested in me and they gave me a project uh, to research for. And also, it had an environment that has been very generous with me. Thank you very much. <laughs>
four hundred dollars uh, a month for a family of five. So it's not uh, Myanmar, but it's also not uh, Cambridge, right? Um, so we had to find a way to, to do this, and what we realized was that what was that governments were in fact interested about the subject. They were just going um, about their solutions in, in, in the wrong way. So we're, we were able to persuade the government to conduct uh, a pilot with us. It was very successful, and that's how we have grown. Uh, we've also experimented with user fees to some extent. Uh, so far, what the analysis says is that they are OK for adults. Uh, they're actually very bad for kids. Uh, we were charging kids initially uh, $3 a week to come to the after school program. And what we did was, again, run an experiment. And we realized that uh, the kids who didn't pay the $3 graduated at a rate that was 10% higher than the kids who were paying. So uh, sometimes intuition does not serve you very well. And that's why we like experiments, because that's, that you can uh, reach uh, unforeseen conclusions. Anyone else? I'm going to say a word that um, I actually am the daughter, in some ways, of a social entrepreneur. Some of my earliest memories are um, going to Mexico with my mom who started a silver jewelry business and so we were often welcomed into the home of silversmiths in these tiny Mexican towns and I remember thinking you know being six or seven that you know people's lives were different elsewhere and that um, and that I've sort of carried that with me then as I grew up um, I actually did not expect to start a social enterprise when I came to graduate school but I met Aleem and his enthusiasm was so <coughs> infectious that I couldn't can resist. I think one of the, the biggest lessons for um, for me as we've developed Love Grant's business model has come from some of the constructive criticism that we've gotten, which is that we're trying to do a lot. We're trying to start a business in Ethiopia, essentially, if you think about it, you know, working with uh, directly with farmers and providing them with microfinance and agricultural training and so forth. And then we're also trying to start an international food company. <laughs> um, but that shouldn't be I don't think discouraging to us. Just because it's big doesn't mean that it's impossible. And I think um, one of our big lessons is, is that we, you know, as long as you bite off what you can chew at that time and get really good at it and learn and iterate, even though we're not a technology company like some of these, we still are, you know, kind of a lean startup and um, and making sure that we're getting feedback all along the way, mastering that stage and then moving on to the next, you know, a little bit of time. I think is um, really critical for us. So thank you. Um, anyone else want to comment before we open it up to the audience? Let me add one thing. So I think when I when I started thinking about <coughs> that someone like me could work on a biotech company, like it's not an option, right? So I think to build that confidence that you can actually find people that mm -hmm. can help you. Mm -hmm. So you know, I really sit down and say, what do I need? I mean, I, I don't even know, what, you know, that vaccine is to be refrigerated. So I need, you know, intuitively I need a chemistry or like, you know, a biologist and I went around and found the best I could, a fantastic one. And then I need someone that deals with all the intellectual property, the licensing models and so law school it's, it's a great place. Uh, at the same time we need someone to manage the finances and make sure that someone give us some credit. Um, and so that, that was my other co-founder for the business school. So I think, you know, it's the environment that you can um, tap into, it's, it's pretty fantastic. Trying to get as many people as possible at the level where you are, and now we're at the level in which we can contact the you know world most expert in vaccine, and the person would basically sit on your board. So you know it's, it's a process that that goes through. It is the same uh, you know basically patching the spoil of lack of the skills that I think for us was, was very crucial. And I remember one investor that told us that our average age was 29 and three months, something like that. Uh, so we got like a bunch of advisor just because they were more than 70 years old. So <laughs> the other day we had an excuse, okay, every day of the company now, it's 50 years old. <laughs> I, I think it's terrific how, uh, I, I know I think uh, some of the folks, your co-founders, you met in a class. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I, um, and likewise. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's uh, terrific that you, um, none of you have been shy to say, uh, I have a gap here, or I don't know what I don't know in this space, and so I want to um, bring in others into this idea. And it's been less about uh, a personal idea and holding credit, uh, hold, you know, keeping credit uh, to yourself, and more about um, the mission of how can we deliver this and bring others to it. It's terrific. Yeah, for me, I think it's the um, the incredible waste and dysfunction in the aid world that I saw, and <laughs> I saw it from 
NGO with the NGO hat on, the World Bank hat on, um, the whole gamut, and um, just said there's got to be a better way um, of having, you know, of helping people, and that the lack of innovation in the sector is really, um, it's, um, yeah, discouraging. So that that's what drove me to um, social entrepreneurship, and also I think the how design really um, supports innovation, and that kind of that kind of lens is, is very much needed. Being flexible and adaptive, and always um, rapid prototyping. Thank you. Um, so we'd love to open up the conversation to wow. all of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, and, and thank you, Melody. Tremendous input from all of y'all, and I appreciate you bringing it together. But I, I'll direct my question first to Debbie and Jim, but obviously open it to all. Debbie, you said the phrase, the emperor has no clothes, and I think from social entrepreneurship that one challenge that I find very constimey efforts is when you have to work with governments who you are implicitly criticizing by virtue of the, the, the benefit you're trying to bring. And so I'd ask anyone, and you all perhaps to, to start with proximity, how is that received? You know, they, they know that you're pointing out their shortcomings, I won't say failures. <laughs> um, I think it's uh, very nuanced. Uh, it's about building trust and credibility, and I think we did that with the government, um, especially after the big cyclone hit and killed over 150,000 people. And we helped um, over two and a half million people just with the cyclone relief work. Um, but we didn't rub it in their faces and we didn't take credit for it. And so they they were really grateful. And they had a very, a, a, one particular general had a, a change of total 180 degrees on um, how he viewed international groups. Um, and I think just the networks I had being Burmese, um, when the country started opening up, they really needed a bridge and someone who had a foot in both worlds who could interpret what's going on outside um, as they were opening up. They had no clue. Um, one of the generals said to both of us in a closed door meeting, said, you're one of the first civilians I've come to know. <laughs> how it, it was just shocking how isolated, 60 years of isolation. So I think um, that kind of credibility and trust building was su is super important. And knowing that you're criticizing them, not in public, we don't talk to the media, but just behind closed doors and really pushing them. Thank you. Other questions? Please. Yeah, I have a question for Moist, but first of all, everybody, all of you, you have beautiful ideas. I mean, I think you deserve a lot of respect and praise, probably more than you're getting for Having the courage to go out there and take action and change people's lives, everybody, all of you, make a huge impact. I, I have to applaud you, everybody. I've been here not knowing what to expect, and just by listening to all your stories, I just want to go out there and do something. <laughs> really, a lot of respect. Um, one more question for you. You are helping a lot of children, also adults. Uh, I'm curious, uh, how do you measure the impact of the education that you you, who you are providing to them they cannot afford by themselves on their own. When they go back to school, do they how do they, you know, how do you measure the impact of their achievement back in school? Or maybe for the adults, is their unemployment rate different? Mm -hmm. Do they have higher salaries? How do you measure that? And maybe use that information to as an argument, maybe in discussion with the government or see if these are the tangible results you can actually achieve by the so we have the benefits of being very flexible. Um, and in the world of education, I would argue that's a very good thing. So we came up with, uh, with the help of some uh, external advisors with a relatively simple system. Uh, what we do is we randomly assign kids to two groups. Uh, one takes uh, math before, and the other takes Spanish before, and then we flip them around. So every six months, we're comparing the scores of those two groups uh, to understand what the um, impact of the program is. And um, what we've seen is that basically some of uh, what I was showing you, which is that in only 30 hours, you can really change uh, how a kid is performing. Um, I remember when I was here at school, you know, we would take a semester long of, stati of, of statistics. And then uh, two days before the test, every, everyone would fail. But then right before the test, someone would explain things in a uh, more simple way that wasn't the proper academic way, but just sort of like the easy way of solving 
the equations, and then everyone would pass the test, right? <laughs> so I, I actually thought that was very powerful, you know? I mean, without the, I mean, it's not academically pure, but it actually works. So the, the way we, we, we try to, to provide education is in the way that is the most simple possible. Um, because we, we, we have other constraints. I mean, we have uh, very little time with, with each uh, individual. And then uh, for adults, what we started understanding was if we could uh, increase their odds of finding employment. And especially with women, we saw that um, we, we ran some research with uh, some students from UPenn. And what it suggests is that uh, people are four times more likely to find employment if they know how to operate a computer and if they know English. Um, so it's something that we take seriously. Uh, I would say it's not all rosy. Uh, it is somewhat simple for you to run a test and have uh, inconclusive evidence come back. Mm -hmm. And you think, you know, we're putting all of this effort and we're investing and we're doing everything and it can be discouraging. But um, since we do this uh, twice a year, uh, whenever something goes wrong, it's like, okay, we're just gonna fix it uh, for the next uh, term. And I think that rapid way of uh, fixing things is, is, is being very helpful. Thank you. Um, one common theme in, in many of your initiatives is um, arranging finance for your clients, a microfinance, and I think it comes from the entre entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship part of social entrepreneurship. The idea is that you want it to be at least um, grounded in market reality. Subsidies are great um, if you have social value added and so on. The role of the Mexican government is, is, is fine. But still, you want to have a market test, and you want to have access, your customers have access to financing. And I think back to the Green Revolution in the 70s, we had this great new technology, these um, high yield seeds that respond to fertilizer, but unless the farmers can buy the seeds and the fertilizer, it doesn't work. <coughs> so, um, Jim, you mentioned kind of flip microfinance or the model a little bit, and others mentioned it in passing. So, so the question is, how important has um, client access to finance meant for access to your products, and what have you learned in trying to provide access to microfinance in your business model? Yeah, for us it's been absolutely critical. I mean, they say distribution is king and financing is queen. It's, uh, <laughs> you, you know, we just really couldn't get people, it's about affordability. That's right. And uh, even selling small products for $10, a lot of people can't afford that with cash. Because it's lumpy. It's a lumpy. They say, can you just give me 30 days? And uh, so it's a, it was, it's a really critical part of our business. Uh, we were you know, talking to a lot of farmers and they kept saying, we hate microfinance. We just hate it. And you, know, you start probing why, and well it's because for a farmer they need money at the beginning planting season, and then mo traditional microfinance is payments every two weeks. Well where are you gonna get money? If you're a farmer every two weeks, you go to the money lender. And so your implicit interest rate's 15, 20% a month, if you can get it. So a lot of people just can't <coughs> afford these technologies, can't afford the kinds of investment they want to make. And so financing has been absolutely critical for us and thinking innovatively about financing has been, it's a, it's a in Myanmar it's a total cash business, it's a tough business to be in, but you don't have the social impact if you don't do it. So in your case, you arrange the repayment schedule to match their cash flow. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, you know, in Ethiopia, um, Green Revolution has helped make higher yielding seeds and fertilizers available in the country and distribution is possible. There isn't the bill, farmers can't afford to buy them at planting. Um, they don't have the collateral to get a loan to purchase that. So that's why the low grade business model is designed around building a relationship with the farmers so that we can purchase, we can prepay their seed and fertilizer costs. And then by purchasing the product directly from them, we can just recover those costs at harvest and leaving them the ability to tend to the crops without having to repay um, interest during the growing season. It's actually for the airline, um, how do you market and advertise your product in the US? Because it's certainly about the percentage of the sale, and for that kind of product, how do you market your product in the US? Can you use that to increase the sales? Because people feel good, like women, salad, mm -hmm. oil, that feel like yeah, no, that's a really good question. So our whole model is really built on sending the profits back to Ethiopia, because um, really we are a, we are registered as Massachusetts Benefit Corporation, which means that we are accountable um, on our board of directors to our social impact. Um, obviously, we need financing to grow the, the company, but um, also the point is to sort of always send back um, the profits to Ethiopia. 
No, we don't have yeah. percentage right now. But the yeah. idea is really that um, is that we use the profits for the financing of um, seed and fertilizer. And also then to be able to expand the number of farmers that we're reaching. So the more profits we make, the more farmers that we can work with. On the first point, um, we're, we're actually, um, you know, we just launched in December, so um, marketing has very much been word of mouth. <laughs> um, but we're fortunate. The gluten-free community in the United States is actually very closely knit. Um, they're very active online with different communities, blogs. Um, there's a lot of cross crossover with sort of health food eaters, yoga enthusiasts, et cetera. So we're really tapping into um, to those uh, sorts of markets. We've been super fortunate to have a lot of great press recently. Aleem and I just recorded a, a segment for Dinner Party Download, which will air in 130 cities around the country shortly. Uh, bon Appetit mentioned us. So we're, you know, there are not many um, companies in the United States right now that are looking at TEF as the next quinoa um, or as sort of the superfood that we see it as. Uh, so we're hoping to sort of ride that wave. I was curious whether, excuse me, all of your companies are for profit companies. And specifically, those when you were talking about innovative revenue models and who clients are, I just wondered if you could just talk a little bit, all of you, about who your clients or customers are and who revenue. In our case, we are a for-profit social enterprise, we're a corporation, and the way we approach government was as any contractor would, so in the way, same way that governments contract people to you know, either build weapons or build schools, uh, we told them we can do this a lot more efficiently than, than you. And it was a very bold statement at first. Uh, we were 27, and we were like, okay, we signed this great initiative, and what you have to do is pay for it and not do anything yourself. Because if you do, you're going to screw up, and we showed them evidence that, <laughs> showed them that was true. And so they went with the pilot, and they, 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 they have seen the, the, the results. So, so it's a, a fairly complex, complex relationship. Um, I would say that the, the onus is on us to, to prove that it's actually uh, better than the, than the public culture. And it, it can be you know, like 5% better, it needs to be like three times better. Russ, um, maybe I make yeah. one point. So we had a lot of debates um, at the inception phase whether we we're going to be a um, for profit, <coughs> not for profit, hybrid. Um, so we, I think your question is spot well on because we have to think about who are our clients. And you know, the mission is really to bring vaccine to as many people as possible, but we don't create our own vaccine, we make existing vaccine better. So we basically have to work with the big five vaccine manufacturers, actually four now, because GSK just bought the this a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, so there's four of them, right? And the conception of all these companies, anything but social enterprise. I mean, who thinks that big pharma is anything related to <laughs> I mean, someone can argue. Um, so, you know, we have to struggle with that. And the trade-off are pretty huge. We are a for-profit company, so getting grants, there is a lot of talk about private company getting foundation might be, it's, it's hard. It's really, really hard. So there is another example, for example, of a sister company, I call them, not really sister, but friends, and uh, they work for an, a diagnostic company here in, in Cambridge, so it's called DFA, Diagnostic for All, and they decided to be a non-for-profit company, and they get so much money from the Gates Foundation, they get so much money from all these others. So we talk a lot about being a private company and not being too much difference in terms of being able to attract public resources. My full-time job is to attract public resources, and it's really, really I can go to the investor community and have a great pitch and show profit potentials and, and you know raise a million dollars, but it's really hard to do the same if you're a private company with the foundation, with the public money. Uh, but we have to do that because our clients are in the end of the day big companies that want to interface with someone that is another private company that plays by the same principle. So I think that was the main decision in the end. Um, and now the struggle is uh, to make sure that those the high level mission they want to achieve in terms of maximizing the impact of their technology, applying to as many products as possible, making sure that a company doesn't just take this technology and apply to some vaccine that has no relevance uh, in developing care. So we have all these things to manage now because we made that choice. So is your client going to governments and developing countries or would it be pharmaceutical companies? Pharmaceutical companies. So government buy vaccine from the pharmaceutical company and we work with the pharmaceutical company to make the vaccine better. So uh, the interesting thing is that how do we play the pitch with the government and say, government, ask the pharma company to have a vaccine that doesn't need to be in the fridge and, and stop buying refrigerators. So that's a big ask that we have.
that's how it's been intuitive. But sorry. For us, we were a nonprofit because in 2004, we really didn't have any other organizational choice. There was U.S. sanctions, EU sanctions, really not possible to do private business. So we had to set up an umbrella. Now we've got really five different business units. Our, our farm finance business is a for-profit business. It's, going to be, it's, it's under the umbrella. It's going to be spun out into a for-profit business. Our energy business is a, pretty much a break-even business. Our irrigation business is a sub, minorly subsidized business. So blended, we're about 55%. Um, revenue generating all our income and the rest is philanthropic money. What's interesting, like we, you know, we're in the energy market, energy industry, we have Philips, we have other people coming <coughs> in, uh, Japanese companies, many of them are getting subsidies to enter that mar enter the market. So it's very difficult. I mean, these are all private companies. Big companies are, are using philanthropic money, uh, whether it's World Bank money or found private foundation money to enter this, this market. I think we have time for one last question. Any takers? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I want to thank our fantastic speakers, and I also want to thank all of you for being with us here today. Please enjoy the rest of Ideasphere. Thank you.